Welcome to the Back to Me podcast, where we help multicultural incoming freshmen, women, and men manage their entire college experience throughout post-graduation to successfully transition into entrepreneurship and corporate workspaces as new hires. Back to me. Everyone, it's your host, Yoli Tamu. There is no greater gift than staying alive and living a healthy lifestyle by avoiding generational pitfalls. In this week's episode of our third annual Divine Nine series, How Sororities and Fraternities Support Mental Health Awareness, we are joined by Marcus Bailey, the 17th East Central Province Pole March and Zeta chapter member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. This certified nutrition consultant, personal trainer, and digital and traditional media marketing leader encourages you to focus on three things to improve your lifestyle and prevent the number one killer of most Americans today. Learn how your mental health, diet, and overall mood are connected. Then take control of your daily responses based on the control you take over yourself first. Enjoy. Today, we have another incredible, powerful guest representing the Zeta chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. He is the regional president of East Central Province. Mr. Marcus Bailey, welcome. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for all you do and thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so grateful to have you. Now, you are a certified personal trainer and a nutrition consultant. So I'm glad that you're with us so we can talk about, you know, health and physical health as well as mental because we're in Mental Health Awareness Month. But that physical component is very important. And so I think it's really great that you can talk to us about that. So now as a certified trainer and a consultant in nutrition, what motivated you to just go that direction to even help young people? Because I think you serve young people too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's a great question. So I think I speak for, I definitely myself and maybe a lot of people when, you know, we typically reach out to help young people for one of maybe two reasons. One, later in life, we hate the fact that we maybe found out that maybe we were given bad information. Like, you know, I grew up believing this. And this was wrong. And maybe I was given that out of ignorance, out of spite, out of convenience. You know, parents are like, look, I'm just going to tell you something. And we're like, you know what? I'm not going to let that happen to somebody else. Or for me, it was more, I wish someone was there and I want to be for other people what I wish someone would have been for me. And really, as it relates to helping young people and connecting the health piece to it, there's no better gift to give a young person. It can't be paid for with money or gained education or, you know, the cooler you are, the better health you are, you have. That's not the case. There's no better gift than to give a young person than the opportunity to have a life of better health and the ability to prevent chronic disease, which is plaguing our community, is plaguing our families. It's something that we don't try to fix until we are diagnosed. So to me, there's no better gift. Money can be replaced. All those things that we're warned about, hey, don't forget to do this with your finances. We warn young people about all kinds of things that are definitely important, except for what I consider to be maybe the most important, and that's how to stay alive and stay healthy. Because to be alive and unhealthy is really not to be even fully alive, to be quite honest. So I consider it a great privilege and a great honor to be able to help young people to avoid the pitfalls that we have fallen into for generations. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking as a regional president of your organization, you know, your young initiates, do you speak about this often? Do you guys have these types of nutritional conversations? Because, you know, we hear that men don't take care of themselves as much as women do, or I've heard that. Is that a true statement? (laughs) I don't know. You know, I would believe that to some extent. And I 100%, and I say this as humbly as I possibly can, if you were to ask anyone definitely within the East Central province, and to be quite honest, really across the country, not that I know everybody and everybody knows me, but if you ask them, tell me one thing about Brother Bailey, and the one thing they will absolutely tell you is he's all about his health. And that to me is a good thing because I don't do it from the, let me touch your plate and tell you what you should and shouldn't be eating. 
But every opportunity I get, I try to inform and influence other people. I don't want to make anyone feel negative. I don't do it in a negative way. But there's one thing that I always say when I've gotten access to the microphone, which is a lot, and that's take better care of yourself. Take control of your health and wellness. Regardless of what you choose to do, make your choice based on good information. So I'm not going to tell you what you should and shouldn't do, how much you should and shouldn't work out. I'm going to give you information and I'm going to let you decide what to do with it. But what I won't let you do is walk out of here misinformed about your opportunities and your options to have better health. I can't force you to do it. But what you won't do is say, Brother Bailey never told me I had a choice. He never told me I had an option or there was a better way or there was an opportunity where I could get off of this medication or beat this chronic disease. So 100%, I definitely use that bully pulpit to do that. That's great. That's great that they know you for that. And so then I was just thinking about our community. You know, we find out or we hear a lot with people of color that, you know, there's a lot of obesity and people are not eating properly because you've got a liquor store at every corner and a church down the block. You know, you got so many (laughs) distractions that people don't really take the time to invest in their health and the quality of food. So how do you feel about the current state of fitness in our communities and even nutrition right now? Three words, bad, getting worse. And let, let me start with some data. So first of all, if you look at the top 10 killers in America, and I'll pull out the one that's considered unintended accidents, that would be car accidents, gun violence, whatever the case might be. So let's pull out and just talk about the other nine, which are quote unquote, I'm air quoting here, natural causes. The number one killer kills as many people as the other eight, eight of the other nine, rather. The number two killer kills almost about as much as eight of the other nine. So the top two, heart disease, number two, cancer. American Heart Association says nine out of 10 cases of heart disease are preventable with lifestyle change. American Cancer Society says at least five, arguably more out of 10 cases of cancer are brought about by and prevented by lifestyle. So that being the case, I mean, if you there's 13 types of cancer that you give yourself a 50% chance of avoiding just by walking 10,000 steps a day. So that being said, and knowing that we are disproportionately affected by all of these, it's getting worse because we continue to increase the number of people, 1.3 million just for those top two, who die from preventable causes. And if you look back, when all this really got bad and, and when... Insulin resistance, which is really the root cause of diabetes, of course, and heart disease, Alzheimer's disease is type 3 diabetes, you know, referred to PCOS, hypertension. It all is related to lifestyle. So it's getting worse because our lifestyles are getting worse, because our options are getting worse. And what we do with our opportunities to eat and exercise are getting worse. And really, there's three things that we can do controllable. That's when we eat, what we eat, and why we eat. Those are three things that, you know, certainly we can talk a little bit more about, but it's getting worse because we don't take control of those three things. We blame our ancestors. We say this, what what can you do? All in God's plan. Well, my grandmother had it, so I guess I got to get it. And hey, some things you just can't control. And we just throw our hands up as it relates to our own health. Do you think it's related to COVID? Like, you know, people have been sitting at home and Netflix and chilling and (laughs) don't really want to get out and walk. You know, I I would maybe give COVID some credit, but in 2019, the number one and the number two and the number three killer. I mean, the only only difference between the top 10 killers in the last, you know, few years is COVID just now creeped into the top 10. But heart disease is still number one and has always been number one for a long time. Cancer has been number two for a long time. So there really is no excuse for COVID other than the fact that now there's just this other thing, and I won't get too deep into it unless you permit me, but there's this other thing that we think we have no control over, and that's COVID. And we think that, well, this is yet another disease that it's a roll of the dice and you're stricken with it and you have no ability to take personal responsibility of your risk and of your ability to recover which is, again, data coming out now that it's now popular and and all the drug companies have made their money and we can say this stuff now without being censored. You do have opportunities based on your personal health, your personal habits, and your physical condition 
to everyone's going to get it, but certainly get it to a much lesser extent and certainly greatly drastically reduce your risk of any severe cases down to the point where now you really just have to deal with your high risk categories, which would be age and pre-existing conditions and respiratory issues and all that kind of stuff versus everyone has the same risk. So not to go down that, that path, but COVID did increase the amount of people that were door dashing and all that kind of stuff and gyms closed, McDonald's is open. So we can get in all that type, you know, that, that was certainly a problem, but heart disease by and large still remains a problem. Even with COVID now, quote unquote, gone or not as much of an emergency, we have the same habits that we had before COVID hit. It sounds like what you're saying is as opposed to vaccinations, if we were eating better, if we were, you know, taking care of ourselves with supplements, maybe then there wouldn't be as much of a need for vaccinations. Is that where you were headed? Well, yeah, I recommend anyone that wants to or has continued to get vaccinations 100 percent do that. This is not a pro or con on vaccinations. However, the data 100 percent shows that the people that were greatly and disproportionately hospitalized and had severe cases were overweight, were hypertensive, had heart conditions, were insulin resistant, were low on vitamin D, were not physically active. Numerous studies were published and now are again now just being talked about where anyone who did 60 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous exercises reduced your chances of severe COVID by 95%. That doesn't mean you won't get it. That doesn't mean you're guaranteed to not have a severe case. But we were just told you've got one way in and one way out. And whenever you try to say, no, no, there are other things that you can do, just like every other disease, to give yourself a better shot. Your body is built to fight disease. That is what we are absolutely meant to do. However, it can only do what you equip it to do. So we were under this guise that you got one way in and one way out, and all the other controllable items based on your lifestyle were dismissed and discarded. Therefore, we were in a bad situation. So I'm not saying vaccines could have been not rolled out and should not have been rolled out. However, I believe it should have been more of a at-risk population. You know, a 22-year-old is certainly a much different conversation than a 65-year-old as it relates to what your prevention and what your, what your options should be and what your risk ultimately is in terms of how important it is for you to get it and be mandated to get it and all these other kind of things. But no, I'm, I'm not anti-vaccine at all. However, what I am is anti pharma's the only solution. And that's what I don't like and did not like about the whole pandemic is we were given one solution and we ignored all the others that have kept us alive for hundreds of thousands of years. And all of a sudden, the immune system will just throw that out the window and let's, let's rely on big pharma to take care of us. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about some some real stuff. I mean, I know someone who is a, a vegan and she got it, but she recovered so quickly because of her lifestyle. So I know what you're talking about. So now you are in the process of writing a book mm -hmm. and you brought up a few points that maybe you can go into, but you know, how are you taking care of yourself? How do you preserve your physical health first? Because I think you named a few things and then your mental health. What's your practice? Yeah, well, first of all, as it relates to the mental health, and in writing the book, you know, there's a lot of things where diet and mood are connected, first of all. And we know mood and mental health are connected. So you talk about serotonin levels, you talk about vitamin D levels, the gut brain connection, you know, that the gut is often referred to as the second brain. So there are a lot of things chemically that we can do diet wise to make sure that our hormones are able to do what they need to do, produce the right amount of serotonin, where we're not supplementing hormones and things like that. And, and, you're getting adequate sleep and adequate rest. So one of the things that I do specifically to make sure that my mental health is preserved is my diet, because I know that there is a lot that goes into diet and mood. As an example, you know, mental health is impacted by the amount of addictions and the level of addiction that we have to certain things. And one thing that we just are not willing as a society to admit to, because it's not profitable to do so, is sugar is really no different than heroin. It's an addictive substance. It sends us on these highs and lows. We're now becoming a dopamine or, or have become a dopamine-based society because of our sugar addiction. And when you've got these mood swings and withdrawals and highs and lows and all those kinds of things, that, have, that impacts your mental 
health because you're high, you're low. And now when you're at your low, at your lowest, you know, now you're thinking about different, you know, different thoughts come about. And then with exercise, I exercise seven days a week. Anyone can exercise at whatever, whatever schedule they want. But I personally have adopted a no days off mentality because it gives me energy. It releases endorphins. Here's the other thing that I'd like to say about mental health, diet, and exercise in general. When you take control of something like your own body, which let's just be honest, the house that you live in, yeah, that's kind of your house, but you really only have one real home on this planet, and that's your body. When you exercise your personal power to control what goes in your mouth, what goes in your body, and what your body does every single day, be it sit down, get up and move, feel better, be strong. When you take control of that, that grows to every other aspect of your life. And I 100% believe one of the things that really keeps me positive and sharp and able to deal with the pressures of the world is because I've taken control of the one thing that most people take the least control of. So if I can control what goes in my mouth, I certainly can control what comes out of it. You know, if I can control what I do with my body and I can put pressure and stress on myself every single day in the form of physical exercise and exertion, then what happens at work is minor. If I can resist the temptation of marketing, of all the things, the peer pressure, first of all, it's definitely hard to go out and sit at a table with 10 people. They get fried chicken, macaroni and cheese and you get a salad. I mean, you just wait on the comments that are come come your way. Rabbit. So if I can deal, yeah, yeah, you know what you're gonna bring some grass with you. <laughs> so if I can deal with those peer pressures and negative forces of the world and drive up and down the street and see McDonald's and Taco Bell and this and that, if I can pass those up and have the discipline to go home and cook my own food, then again, the things that and I say this respectfully because this, you know, there's there's definitely all kind of conditions that are outside of these minor things, but the normal day-to-day pressures of the world that may start to weigh down on people and really impact their mental health. As Stephen Covey said, your circle of influence starts to grow and grow. If I can control this circle of influence and not worry about this circle of concern, yeah, I'm concerned about this stuff, but I'm focusing in on this inner circle. And the more you focus on that inner circle, the bigger it gets. So in my world, There definitely are things that happen. I'm affected by goods and bads and positives and negatives for sure. But I have a much deeper and I think greater sense of, but wait a minute, I can control my response to this because I've taken control of my body, of myself. And I know that when I do that, I get results. I feel the results. I don't have to wait on someone else to validate them for me. My body does that for me. I don't need anyone else's opinion. It's not based on what anyone else thinks. It's a direct connection to say, when I do and take control of myself, my thoughts, I get a direct result or, you know, a direct response. So that's another big part of how I stay mentally sharp. And really in writing the book, it helps me. And I would recommend everyone not journal. And I'm not saying if you're journaling, stop doing it, Neil. But I think if you write with a purpose, and you write things and you speak things for with a purpose. Instead of just random journaling, let me tell you what happened. With, if you write with a purpose, it really helps you bring clarity to the things that are going on in and around you. So the book writing is, first of all, going to be hopefully something that at least one person hears, reads, and shares, and makes one change in their life that adds one, two, ten years to their life. It would have been worth it. But it definitely has honed my skills to be able to articulate thoughts and and really process things differently and write with a purpose and speak with a purpose. So that's definitely been helpful. And I'm just a lot more intentional about what I say and do because of the control that I've taken. Uh, And again, I certainly have my issues. Everybody has their issues. We got our ups and downs that we need help with. But I feel a lot better about my chances of staying mentally healthy because of the control and the steps that I've taken to stay physically healthy. You know what? I I was just sitting here thinking, it's so powerful what you're saying. When it comes to young people, the fact that you're in their life now is important because self-esteem is everything. And everything you just said is connected to that. If you don't even have a sense of self to value your body, 
You understand what I'm saying? There's no connection in what you're saying. So it's like if they don't even love <laughs> themselves enough to protect the body, that's where there's a disconnect. And I and I feel that you are connecting the mental and the physical, which is great. So it's it's powerful to hear that. And if you put that in a book as you are about the discipline of mentally valuing yourself first, then maybe that'll connect the dots. You know what I mean? Hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're 100% right. And it's so minor to go to a family cookout, as an example. It seems minor to go to a family cookout and say, hey, man, do you want this? No, I'm good. So to be able to tell someone no is something that we need to be able to do to protect yourself, to protect, protect your mindset, to protect your, your, your passion and your values. You've got to be able to say no to the things that don't match with those values so that you can develop that self-identity that you're very confident in that no one can really shake. So saying no to something as simple as, hey, no, I don't want that, those fries, or no, I won't, don't want that soda. That gives you that practice of saying, well, you know what? No, I don't want to go here. No, I don't want to listen to that. No, I don't want to go down this path that you're going. You know why? Because that doesn't align with what my values, with my sense of self are. So it definitely gives you that practice. And the younger someone is where they can start saying no to what they don't like and being confident, walking into a group of people and potentially being looked at as an oddball or an outcast or, you know, what does this do? You know, and not giving into the pressures of what everyone else just does because it's cool. And you'd be surprised how much pressure is built around eating, social eating, family eating. You know, that's where we drive a lot of our family values is sitting around a dinner table and eating food and grandma's cooking and all this kind of things. And when you start saying no to grandma's cooking, wait a minute, you part of this family, ain't you? Wait a minute. My, my connection to this family has nothing to do with my connection to this plate. So I'm looking at all of you and how you look and feel about yourselves and the health conditions you're dealing with. And I love you enough to not make the same mistake. And it just gives you so much power. I mean, that's my only regret. And that's why I love talking to young people, because when and a young person can make that stance, right? it's just going to grow early. It's just a seed. It's not, you know, the be all end all, but planting that seed and being able to say no to these things and do what's best for you and go to the gym instead of going to kick it somewhere or saying, hey, I haven't worked out and start to prioritize yourself over everything else. It goes into so many other areas of your life. So it's absolutely one of the things I love about talking to young people about it. And then I was going to also add that you gave us some stats, but I'm sure you have some personal experience. I'm sure something happened. Were you in the hospital at one point and you woke up and you said, hey, I'm going to take care of myself? Because usually something dramatic has to happen to us before we wake up. So was there an aha moment for you? One hundred percent. So about 15 years ago, my son, my oldest son was two years old. I got three kids. My oldest son was two years old. I was looking through some photos and I looked at me holding him and for the first time, I saw those photos before, but at that moment, I was absolutely disgusted at what I looked like. I was at least 260 pounds. That was the highest I'd weighed myself. Somewhere around there, maybe a little bit more. I mean, real fat in the neck. I mean, just swole up. And I was disgusted by what I saw. And I was angry at myself for getting there. And I was angry at everyone else for watching me get there, which told me, first of all, yeah, people love you enough to not criticize you and tell you, hey, man, it might be time to put the Pop-Tarts down. But they also maybe don't love you enough to tell you to put the Pop-Tarts down. And you're going to have to start doing that yourself. So that was my aha moment. I was low on energy. I wasn't sick. So I hadn't gotten tested for anything, but I would bet any amount of money I was at least pre-diabetic based on my habits. And that was my aha moment. And from that point, I recognized something else. A lot of times we pursue things in life because of, man, I can't wait to get this so I can have this great feeling. You know, so we're in the habit of running towards something good. At that moment, I recognize, you know what my biggest motivator, and it still is to this day, I'm not running towards something good. I'm not working out towards to get to some competition. Every workout I do, every bite I take is because I hate and would never go back to where I was. So when I see an apple and a hamburger, 
when I look at that hamburger, I don't see, you know, or, or whatever it might be, a cake or whatever it might be, a cheap meal, call it whatever you want. I just don't see a meal. I see an instant regression back to that 260 pound person that I was disgusted to look at. So hate is just as strong a, a motivator as hope is. So that was my aha moment. And everything I do, everything I say, everything I eat, every workout I have is to run as far away from that person as I possibly can. And I know time and I know pressure and I know apathy. And as soon as I slip up, that takes me one step back toward that person. So that's why I have this no days off. No one's perfect. Let me just be clear. No one's perfect. But I don't plan on a cheap meal. I don't plan on, a, on an off day. If it happens, it happens. And I'm back on it the very next day. So I don't give myself permission to do that. But I don't give myself grief if it absolutely happens out of my control. So yeah, that was my aha moment. And you're right. A lot of people have them. Unfortunately, it comes too late in their life when now you have to be on medication or it's going to require a surgery. So I was fortunate enough not to get to that point. And I'm open to share with people that story. And I'm happy to share with people. It's okay to hate what you've become, the habits that you've allowed yourself to, to take. So I wasn't hating myself. I didn't, there was no self-hate. So from, from a mental health and from a self-image standpoint, I didn't hate me. I hated the fact that I had let me do these things. So that's really what it was. And I know that I love myself enough and I will never let myself regress back to those habits because those Pop-Tarts didn't love me back. You know, that those gallons of soda, they didn't love me back at all. So therefore, you know what? I hate you and you hate me. So let's just stay away from just like a bad relationship. Now that's a good analogy. <laughs> This is not good for me. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen, this is so powerful what you're saying. I mean, my goodness, it's all juicy stuff. We're here for this Divine Nine series, and you are a Kappa Alpha Psi. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, how has that fraternity served you in your life, just moving forward, just, you know, the man you are today? How has that fraternity assisted you? The greatest thing Kappa Alpha Psi has done for me is it has given me what we might call a sandbox. Or in the programming world, they call it like a dev development server where you can try out all your code and see if it works and if not. But nothing's live, like nothing's running out there for the public to see. It gives you that development and that sandbox to try, to refine, so that when it does go to production, you know, it's perfect. Cap Alpha Psi has put me around men who allow me to make mistakes and tell me where I made mistakes honestly and openly. Put me in a position where I can speak in front of people. Put me in a position where I can try ideas, where I can explore, become a leader, be able to listen to the stories of other people unselfishly. When I go out into the corporate world and I go to my job, you know, senior vice president and CEOs, they're only going to share with me what they think is, first of all, HR appropriate and they're only going to share as much with me about how they became successful based on our relationship. If they don't know me, eh, hey, look, man, I worked hard. I put my nose down. They're going to give me the, the real glossed over stuff. But being in Cap Alpha side, they'll tell you what it really takes. And I am sharpened every single time I interact with a member, with, with a brother, I'm sharpened. So when I go out into the real world and non-members see me, they see a sharpened version of me, not because of how good I am, but because of how many grindstones I've ran up against and, and polished myself with. That's what Cap Alpha Psi has been to me as a polishing stone or a grindstone. So that when I go out into the world and I'm sharp and I am the man that I am and the person that I am, that's because I've just come from a meeting and I've been sharpened, you know, and I've just talked to someone and I got sharpened. So that's what Cap Alpha Psi has done for me. And again, I, I love hopefully being that grindstone or that sharpening stone for others. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like what you said earlier about that inner circle being more important than the outer circle and that it will spread eventually. So, so that's great. So to focus on your inner circle. All right. This has been so good. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you being with us and you're giving me things to think about. <laughs> I'm going to go look in the mirror. 
Say, do you love you? <laughs> That's what I'm like saying. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. So now we always wrap with these final words of encouragement for our young listeners, even adults. I mean, parents are listening to us. Everybody's listening at this point. What would you like to leave our listeners with as we think about mental health awareness, as we think about really loving and taking care of ourselves? What final words, if you got? So one word that I would say, and it kind of relates to some of the things that we've talked about, particularly those younger people who are transitioning out of that, you know, I'm out of the house, but I'm not quite out of my parents' pocket. You know I mean? We're, we're still, maybe their insurance is in my name. You know, we, we still got a couple of things that we share financially or whatever. I would say simply grow up. And what I mean by grow up is this. There are a lot of things that we can't wait to move out and get up, up underneath of our parents' rules so that we can be our own person, our own self man, I can't wait to do this because my mom never let me do it. And as soon as I get grown, I'm going to do it. And we become our own person. And what we forget is there are certain habits that we've got that we did learn from our parents that are not good. So as it relates to diet, exercise, as it relates to a lot of different things, we take for granted. We think our parents gave us great information. In a lot of cases, they do. But let's just be honest. They only gave us what they understand and what they know. You know, they advised us to the level of their understanding. So when I say grow up, just really take an assessment, say, why do I do the things that I do? Is there a positive or a negative benefit to it? Because it's a habit, that doesn't mean I have to continue to do it. The other thing is to everyone, and again, related to mental health, related to physical health, is work harder on yourself than you do on your job or work harder on yourself than you do at school. And again, that's reading information. That's knowing that you don't have to be a plumber to know how to use a toilet. So you don't necessarily have to be a doctor to understand how your body works. You don't have to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or you don't have to be a member of the clergy to be able to read and spread positive messages. So work hard on yourself. I didn't really learn that until late. I wish I would have known earlier. And the last thing I'll say is young people be encouraged Do not buy into this kids these days dialogue. And I would encourage the old people to stop using the kids these days dialogue. I really don't like the fact that older people romanticize their time as children, how hard it was and how hard you became and how great you are. If you've got to talk about the hardships that you had 30 years ago, then actually it wasn't a positive experience. It was a negative one. And you really haven't healed from it. And what you're doing is you're telling these kids that they're less than because they didn't go through those same damaging experiences that you did. So my advice to older people is stop comparing this generation to how you grew up. Encourage them and young people be encouraged. You're, you have so many things. You're much sharper, at least than I was. I can't speak for you, but these young people that I run into, they're so much sharper than I was, so much more promise, so much more opportunities. I mean, they're starting businesses in college, grinding, doing all kinds of great things. So please be encouraged that even though older people may not give you the credit for the things that you're doing and how hard it is growing up in a 2023 world versus a 1993 world, a lot of things have changed. Please be encouraged and don't buy into that kids these days dialogue and how much better or worse you may be based on an older generation. Mm -hmm. So good. So good. Thank you so much. So now if they want to come and check you out, where would you like to send people on IG or LinkedIn maybe to learn more? Yeah. So IG, Marcus Bailey 003. I'm on YouTube under Marcus Bailey Health. And from there, you know, as the book comes out, I'll expand to a couple of more platforms and things like that. But IG, Marcus Bailey 003, YouTube, Marcus Bailey Health, and looking forward to connect. Well, thank you for being a powerful example of a Black man that's taking care of himself. Thank you. I appreciate you. you. In all aspects. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, you take care and we're going to talk really soon. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you again for all you do. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Embrace the value of your no and watch your informed choices take you to places you may have never thought were possible. For more information about other episodes, remember to subscribe to the Back to Me podcast, College and Beyond. I'm your host, Yoli Tamu. 
Leave a review at the end of this podcast. And if you would like to learn more about other special events, join the Back to Me podcast Facebook group or simply text Back to Me to 833-206-4565. Until next time, be well. Back to me. Oh, to me.